Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar, Disease Fighting Foods. My name is Christy Wilking. I work on the community engagement team with Mayo Clinic Health System. Um, Mayo Clinic Health System is committed to improving the health and wellness of the communities we serve, and we are glad um, to be able to offer this presentation today. So a few housekeeping items. We are recording today's webinar and it will be sent out to everyone that registered for the webinar. It might take us a couple of days, but we will get it out to you um, via email. If you do have questions, um, please use the question and answer tool. We will try to get to those towards the end of the presentation um, and try not to use the chat function for questions. We do have a couple poll questions for you today before we get started with the presentation. So we're hoping you can help us answer those. Um, so we'll put up the first poll question for you. Um, so we're wondering, where do you usually source your food? There's five different choices here, grocery store, food shelf or pantry, garden, meal service, fast food or pre-made meals. We'll give you just a few moments to answer the question. All right, so we will show the results. Overwhelmingly, the results are grocery store. So thank you for your input on that one. We have one more question for you, and this is a pre-question, and we will ask you the same question after the webinar. So I'm not going to tell you the answer, um, and we'll go over the answers at the end of the webinar. But please choose what type of food or drinks prevent colon cancer. And you can choose more than one option. So we give you just a few minutes to find the answer to that one. All right, and we'll show the results for that one. Vegetables being the highest with fruits and whole grains and a little bit of red meat. So like I said, we're not going to tell you the answer to that till the end of the presentation because we're going to do a post question, um, hoping that you learn some awesome information from Grace today. So thank you for providing your input on the first two pool questions. Um, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our speaker today. Grace Feldberg is, a, is certified as a specialist in oncology nutrition and has a passion for the power nutrition has on disease prevention. She received her bachelor's degree at Minnesota State University Mankato and has completed her dietetic internship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. For the past 11 years, she has been working at Mayo Clinic Health System in Mankato as a dietitian and supports a wide range of patients to achieve their nutrition goals. With that, I will turn it over to Grace. Thank you, Christy. Um, as Christy mentioned, nutrition is definitely a passion of mine. So it's an honor to be able to speak today um, on foods that will definitely help decrease your risk of developing all sorts of chronic to disease like heart disease, diabetes. Um, and today, as you noticed, I am specialized in oncology nutrition. So some of the emphasis will be on reducing your risk of developing cancer specifically. I just with that, wanted to, I'm having a hard time advancing my slide here. There we go. Um, talk a little bit about um, some of the, the risk for cancer itself. So these are estimated number of new cancer cases projected for 2022. And so if you see that bottom um, red circle, you know, that is nationwide. And um, I found it really interesting to know that about 805,000 of those cases could um, potentially be preventable, not all with diet and activity alone, but a good chunk of it could be. So I just wanted to share that information. Additionally, colon cancer in men and breast cancer in women are among the highest or most common types of cancer. And about 250,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. Close to 5% of men and women are diagnosed with 
colorectal cancer at some point during their life. And more than 1.3 million people are living with colorectal cancer right now. So it's um, something to consider. And I'm sure many of you have been touched by cancer in some way or another. Um, so again, conversation is going to focus on how do we reduce our risk and what those guidelines say. Um, so in front of you, you'll see what our healthy goals should be. And these recommendations really um, for cancer prevention were developed by an expert panel that reviewed many peer-reviewed articles directly looking at activity and diet. Um, the guidelines are really focused on cancer prevention and come from the American Institute of Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund. So as you can see, you want to focus on maintaining a healthy weight if possible. And I know that's easier said than done in many instances. So really focusing on eating healthy, regardless of what your weight is going to do, because we know that we still can have an impact on disease prevention by eating healthy, even if our weight is not trending down by doing so. Uh, avoiding sugary drinks and then limiting consumption of energy dense foods. We want to focus on eating uh, foods mo mostly from plant sources, which is what a lot of the conversation will focus on today is how to get more plants in our diet and what does evidence say uh, to help reduce our risk of disease? What are the compounds in these plants that help that? We want to limit our consumption of red meat, such as beef, pork, and lamb, uh, and avoid processed meats. Uh, if consumed at all, we want to limit alcoholic drinks to two for men and one per day for women. And we can cover it, what that looks like in terms of a standard drink um, further in the presentation. Um, we want to limit consumption of salty foods and processed foods. We do not want to use supplements to protect against cancer. And in some instances, uh, supplements in excess have been shown to promote cancer. So really focusing on healthy diet, whole food forms of nutrition. Um, it is best for mothers to breastfeed exclusively for up to six months. And there's benefit both for the infant and for the mother. Uh, when it comes to if you've had cancer itself, we want to focus on um, certainly symptom management while somebody's going through a cancer treatment. But once somebody has gone through their cancer treatment and they have recovered, the goal are to follow these same recommendations. And last but not least, I'm going to focus a little bit more heavily on activity because this is the only part that I'm going to focus on for exercise. The rest will be diet focused. So when it comes to that exercise, um, we know um, some of the mechanisms of action and how that activity is actually helpful in cancer prevention. Um, obviously, we can uh, maintain a healthier weight when we exercise regularly, which could help out in influencing uh, healthy levels of body fat. It also improves insulin sensitivity and reduced insulin levels, which is really important as elevated levels of insulin-like growth factor can promote the growth of cancer cells. So exercise is useful to help out with um, that insulin regulation. It can decrease levels of bioavailable sex steroid hormones and then also promotes rapid gut transit time, which can reduce the exposure of those colon cells to carcinogens and then improved immunity when we exercise regularly. The recommended amount of activity is uh, 150 to 300 minutes of activity a week, um, focusing on 30 to 60 minutes of moderate physical activity day or about 30 minutes of vigorous physical activity. Moderate intensity would be equivalent to like a brisk walking pace. So if you think about that, ask yourself how close you are to that really finding ways to increase that activity. Again, not just for weight loss benefits, but because of other factors that can help promote um, uh, or decrease your risk of developing cancer in the future. So moving on to diet, um, again, just a few statistics, one in four overall cancer cases could be prevented by a healthy diet and activity patterns. And there's compelling evidence that generous amounts of fruits and veggies as part of a healthy diet can lower your risk of chronic disease, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. So really it's a, it's a, a diet. Um, when we throw more veggies in our diet and throw more fruits in our, di our diet, we're going to help, you know, decrease our hospital stays, decrease the visits to the clinic. Um, many cancers can even take 10 or more years to develop. So nutrition is crucial in making changes every day and committing to those changes is important. 
So I guess the question is, what is it in food that really helps out with that disease prevention and cancer prevention? So in front of you, I have a list of phytochemicals. And so phytochemicals truly are those compounds that we find in our plant sources that help decrease that risk. Uh, phytochemicals are shown to interrupt the process that encourages cancer production. Um, and fruits and veggies or plant foods, I should say, are rich in phytochemicals chemicals, vitamins, and minerals that protect against those diseases. Antioxidants are phytochemicals that work to protect the body from damage. Cancer develops when DNA is damaged and not repaired. Radiation, viruses, and chemicals can all cause that damage, and natural metabolism creates oxidants that can create damage. Antioxidants neutralize this process and essentially protects the body from that damage. There are many, many foods that contain antioxidants, dark chocolate, apples, um, avocados, artichokes, red cabbage, tea, coffee, and a lot of nuts and grains. It's in a lot of the foods that we eat on a daily basis. We just want to be sure we're taking enough of those foods in. Uh, carotenoids also listed up there, such as beta carotene, lycopene, and lutein have also been linked to reduce the risk of some diseases. Carotenoids are highly pigment pigmented. So the reds, the orange, the yellows, and they're fat soluble, meaning they need a source of fat to truly be absorbed. Um, they're also heavy in those dark green veggies. Um, and of course, again, any color, the carrots and sweet potatoes, squash. Um, so incorporating more of those things in, again, will help support your healthy diet. Alpha, beta, and gamma carotene are considered provitamins because they can be converted to active form of vitamin A, also known as an antioxidant. So some of these things I'm sure um, you've heard before, these vitamins and minerals, maybe not realizing they have antioxidant power to them. I also have phytosterols listed, th listed there. Phytosterols occur naturally in small amounts of plant-based foods, um, mostly in nuts and seeds like sesame, corn flour, sunflower, uh, and canola. And these really can help lower cholesterol. What we also know is nutrients and phytochemicals found in plants seem to work independently as well as synergistically together um, to help decrease our risk of cancer, meaning plant-based foods work well eaten in combination with other foods. So for example, in mouse studies of prostate cancer, they showed that a combination of both tomato and broccoli diet was more effective at slowing tumor growth than either tomato or broccoli alone, showing really the power that nutrition has when we team foods together. Plant foods may affect hormones influential in, cancel in the cancer process and the fiber intake from these plants is known to help reduce our risk of cancers, uh, really based on impacting the, um, again, that insulin level. Uh, when we help increase that fiber intake, insulin levels don't rise quite as quickly or as easily as refined uh, carbohydrates or quick sources of carbohydrates in our diet. The healthy bacteria residing in our gut can ferment fiber and other starches to produce compounds known to help promote normal colon development and reduce inflammation. This bacteria can also help convert some of those phytochemicals to more usable or active forms. I know all of this sounds and seems pretty technical and um, there's lots of specifics, uh, but I really want to emphasize what the evidence says. I think a lot of times, you know, we know fruits or veggies are good for us and we know that they're impactful for our health. But a lot of times I think the message gets lost, but once we hear those compounds and what's actually in these foods, some of it becomes a little bit more real and we can think of them more as medicine, that food is med medicine. It creates it. We have chemical compounds in them, no one to help protect our body and help. So what exactly food, what foods exactly have been studied? So there's a list of fruits and veggies in front of you, um, and this comes straight from the American Institute of Cancer Research. And so you can go on their website and actually look specifically uh, at all of these um, 
all of these foods and figure out where is the research within these foods and what compounds are in these foods that help fight disease. Um, soy contains isoflavones, which is a phytoestrogen and soy intake has been associated with lower risk of breast cancer in Asia and prostate and lung and colon cancer. Isoflavones are in some instances have been debated in the past. Some people with estrogen receptive positive breast cancers have been concerned about taking soy and because it is a phytoestrogen, but really studies show that when you take in adequate amounts, you're going to reduce your risk, um, really aiming for about three servings per day. Flax contain lignans and studies show also a reduction in breast cancer there. Green tea, I love to point out, it also it contains a, a compound called epigatal epigallocatechin galatate, which is even more powerful of an antioxidant than the effects of vitamin C or E. Drinking tea can even raise the antioxidant capacity uh, and is shown to decrease risk of breast, ovary, and endometrium cancer. So there's really a lot of power uh, in these foods when we start looking a little deeper and looking at these compounds. Cruciferous veggies are one of my favorite veggies uh, to talk about. That would be the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, that group, they contain a compound called glucosinolates. Uh, and that compound is then further broken down into two additional compounds. And in laboratory studies, these compounds decrease inflammation that could cause cell damage leading to cancer. Walnuts is another fun one to point out. Um, uh, it contains a compound called L-agitantins uh, and also broken down into two additional compounds. And when they look at those compounds, it can decrease damage to DNA that can lead to cancer by influencing gene expression and decrease growth uh, and stimulate self-destruction of mouth, esophagus, breast, cervical and prostate cancers and colon cancers. So there's, a, again, hopefully a few more pieces of information to emphasize just how powerful these plants are. So let's get to the fun stuff. How much should we eat per day? When we talk about fruits or veggies, our goal for fruits is about a cup and a half to two cups of fruits per day. Now I want people to think about getting out of their fruit rep, um, you know, Try something like apricots, fresh figs, pomegranate, or guava, but you really don't have to go outside that comfort zone because apples, berries, and grapefruit, they all contain all, the, all those phytochemical um, compounds too. So you can certainly uh, eat those, or if you do need to find cheaper versions, because some people, uh, well, and with everything rising in the grocery, as far, uh, grocery industry, as far as cost goes, I think everybody's trying to save some money there. Frozen berries are a great way to get all of those antioxidants. It doesn't always have to be fresh. Uh, frozen berries are um, taken straight from the field and flash frozen. And a lot of that nutrition is preserved. So if you're looking for cheaper options, certainly you can go that direction. Now, I didn't see a lot of people use food shelves, but if someone does choose to use a food shelf, there's certainly ways to incorporate some um, fruits and veggies utilizing those places as there's often canned versions as well. And in my opinion, any fruit or veggie is better than no fruit or veggie. So if you are choosing those canned versions, choosing the ones that are in 100% uh, fruit juice, if, that, if that's an option. So ways to incorporate a few more in would be, you know, throwing some berries in oatmeal uh, in the morning or muffins, or uh, certainly a smoothie would be an option as well, or whole wheat pancakes. So the more uh, ways you can find to uh, throw a few of those fruits or veggies in, the better. As far as veggies go, two and a half to four cups of veggies per day is recommended, um, more if it's leaf leafy greens. Uh, and when we talk about veggies, um, we want to also get out of that rut. Consider chayote squash or collard greens or daikon radishes, although maybe you won't find them as readily this time of year. If you plant a garden, you could certainly um, start thinking about some seeds or find these at local farmers markets or even in store. But again, the, the staples that we have in the grocery store, the cabbage, the broccoli, the cauliflower, carrots, they're all rich in phytochemicals. So the idea is making sure you're getting that um, 
those recommended servings per day. Cheaper versions as well. You can buy a whole head of cauliflower for about $3 and frozen veggies can sometimes be uh, less expensive than even the canned versions. And just as with the fruit, when they're flash frozen, a lot of that nutrition is preserved. Um, and you can find high antioxidant foods in a lot of um, a lot of ways. And I shouldn't say just antioxidants, high phytochemical foods in a lot of different places that you wouldn't suspect. Uh, canned tomatoes are higher in lycopene than fresh tomatoes. So it's a great thing to have on hand uh, when you don't have fresh available and certainly could be added to soups or stews or even on a taco night. Moving on to whole grains. So whole grains are another thing that we wanna focus on incorporating on a regular basis. Whole grains are truly just that. The grain itself is taken straight from the field um, and they keep it intact when they grind it down into flour or when they're making it in, or, or when they're just boiling it on the stove to eat. So the reason we want those whole grains is because when you take that grain out of the field and then utilize it, we're, we're preserving the fiber in it and we're preserving those B vitamins in it. And so we want to choose options like 100% whole grain breads or whole grain tortillas when possible. Or if you're already doing those things, consider challenging yourself to just boil bulgar or quinoa and utilizing those in your meals where they're completely uh, or very little, you know, processed very little so that you um, get all of the nutritional benefits from that whole grain. Legumes refers to a, a family of plants, including beans, lentils, and peas, whose seeds develop in the pods and then are usually dried for easy storage. And most of these um, legumes are going to contain protein and folate and potassium and magnesium. And most importantly, they are filled with fiber. And as mentioned earlier, when we get more fiber in our digestive system, we're going to have better blood sugar control. Um, there's going to be lower levels of the, that insulin growth like factor hormone running our uh, insulin growth factor um, in our bloodstream and so we want to focus on foods that contain more fiber recommended serving per day for grains would be three to five ounces an ounce equivalent is equal to one slice of bread a half a cup cooked quinoa bulgar or oats so when you think about that serving size three to five ounces per day ask yourself at a half a cup, if you hold up your fist, about half of your fist is a half a cup. How much are you eating in reference to that? We don't need a whole lot of them. Past recommendations, really old recommendations, our base was grains as our diet, but really we only need about a half a cup three times today per day, maybe a slightly more depending on your activity level. Legumes, the recommended serving would be about one and a half cups per week. Um, so finding ways to incorporate those in. There's lots of creative ways to use legumes nowadays. Um, they even have legume noodles like our uh, garbanzo bean noodles, red lentil noodles, or black bean noodles. These are filled with fiber and are actually very minimally processed. The only ingredient in them most often is just the legume. And so it's kind of a fun way to incorporate more fiber and protein, um, plant-based protein into your diet. Um, a lot of people, again, eat bread daily. I encourage people to switch that up. If you're doing white breads right now, an easy switch would be to go to those whole grain versions. If you're already there taking that next step further, like I mentioned earlier, and trying more um, whole grains that are unprocessed and you're just uh, making those over the stove um, with legumes. Um, a cheaper, easier versions to get in the diet are lentils. Um, they're very inexpensive. They cook quickly. So if you've never used them before, you don't have to soak them all day. Like some beans you do like pinto beans. Um, you're going to have to soak them. It's going to take a little longer, but if you do have an instant pot or a pressure cooker at home, you can decrease the uh, cooking length of time by using those. And again, a really inexpensive way to increase your, your fiber and your protein intake. The, the compounds in these grains and legumes, um, again, um, we want to focus on, you know, where does the evidence lie, what has been studied and why these things are beneficial for us. Phyti uh, phytic acid um, may 
reduce damage to colon cells from free radical uh, free, free radicals produced there. However, the effects of whole grains as a source of protection is not fully known yet. Uh, lignans, um, as mentioned earlier, increase antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and carcinogen deactivating enzymes, and they also decrease the growth and increase self-destruction of cancer cells. So we want to incorporate more of these compounds in our diet. Fermentable fibers found in those legumes, those beans and lentils can be converted to a product called um, butyrate uh, and other short chain fatty acids by our gut bacteria. These short chain fatty acids reduce markers of inflammation and oxidative stress in human clinical trials and show effects on gene expression that can reduce cancer development. So again, I know that all seems pretty technical, but knowing some of the rationale can sometimes be useful in, in pushing us over that edge to make some change. Protein and dairy, legumes, um, we already talked about. Um, and then in terms of amount we should be taking in for protein per day, five to seven ounces of meat or a meat substitute per day. So when we talk about meat substitutes, that would be legumes or um, a dairy product or even eggs can be that meat substitute. Uh, legumes to substitute an ounce of meat, um, you could easily substitute a half a cup of cooked um, peas or lentils. Low fat tofu, um, you can replace a half a cup again with one ounce of meat or protein. A quarter of a cup of cottage cheese can replace a one ounce of meat as well. So portion size of meat does, or, or of proteins does not have to be that big of the meal, which is different than what a lot of us were raised with here in the Midwest. Um, of course, I encourage people to focus more on leaner meats uh, when you are. And I want to talk a little bit about that red meat piece. I think you saw that earlier in the beginning of the presentation and how that impacts our overall health. Um, there's compelling evidence that red meat and process meat, processed meats uh, uh, increased cases of colorectal cancer. The risk of colorectal cancer increases by an estimated 17% for every 100 grams of red meat consumed daily. People who consume red meat should keep intake to about 18 ounces per week, which translates into about two and a half ounces per day. So if you think about a size of a deck of cards, it's a little bit less than that each day. Red meat contains heme iron, which can lead to the production of free radicals, oxidative damage to DNA, protein, and cell membranes that promote the formation of carcinogenic compounds in the gut. Avoiding red meat is distinctly different um, uh, in cancer prevention than it is in other diseases like heart disease because it focuses more on that um, source of heme iron versus fat content, which is what a lot of the goal with reduction of red meat is for other diseases like heart disease. Uh, I also have up here um, avoiding uh, gr charring meat when you're grilling. So grilling can be a great way to make um, meals because it it's a lean cooking method. You're not using a lot of fat when you are grilling. However, when we grill meat specifically, we create compounds called heterocyclic amines and polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons. These compounds have been directly linked specifically to colon cancer. And so we want to find ways to decrease that um, in our diet. There are a few ways you could consider doing that. First, you can marinate your meat. Um, and uh, when you cook it on the grill, that marinating actually protects the meat some. There's also recommendations out there to par cook your meat, meaning cook it in the oven for a period of time and then finish it on the grill for a little bit of that flavor. Um, so we decrease the, the length of cooking time that it is on that grill. Um, you can cook veggies, however, on a grill and never create any of these compounds. It's directly impacted by the meat and how it changes um, chemically once we have that char on there. Um, and uh, the um, compounds that are created when that fat melts off of the meat and hits that fire and flames up over that meat, those are those compounds that are created. 
So we want to focus on healthier sources of protein in our diet when we can. Moving on to fats, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on fats today. Um, we want to focus on monounsaturated fats when we can. Those are our healthier sources of fats, which are listed there. Serving size a day is three to five servings per day. Uh, and we want to focus on what that serving might look like. I think all too often we think more is better for us, but we really want to focus in the fat section on what's just enough. A serving size is equivalent to one teaspoon of oil, four walnut halves, eight whole peanuts or a sixth of an, uh, of an avocado. So when you think about that three to five servings a day, um, you really want to think about, are you using the whole avocado on your avocado toast? Or are you using just a small amount to give it that flavor and that texture? So how to wrap it up and put it all together. This is called the New American Plate. This is by the American Institute of Cancer Research. And it really focuses on what should our plates look like at meals, right? We talked about serving sizes of all of these categories. How do you put it into perspective? And how do you make it just feel a little bit more natural when you're sitting down to eat a meal? What you want to think about is what does your plate look like? Um, again, the American Institute of Cancer Re uh, Research recommends you make two thirds of your plate, um, the veggies, the fruits, the whole grains, beans, and then a third or less of that plate, an animal protein source. So uh, as you can see that plate right there, it has a lot of color uh, with the greens and the reds and the yellows, um, and there's small amounts of oil used in the cooking process. And sweets. So we want to focus on sweets in moderation. We know that sugar can increase um, excess carbohydrate and excess sugar can increase our risk of a lot of chronic disease. So we want to decrease that. I think the big thing is to pay attention to what you're taking in. All too often, especially this time of year, I think it's easy to grab a handful of jelly beans from somebody's container they have on their desk or if you keep them at your home and we eat them without thinking about it. And it's handful after handful when we don't even see stop and think. And so we want to taste and savor and truly enjoy these things if there are if they are in our diet. And if you choose to think about ways to incorporate more phytochemicals in the sweets that you're choosing, try chocolate tofu mousse or chickpea cookie dough, um, or even some energy bites with dried cherries and some dark chocolate, there are ways to add more of those phytochemicals to your health bank. And last but not least, I do want to focus on fluid intake because um, alcohol is in that category and we know that alcohol can increase our risk of cancer. Water should be the main source of hydration when we are drinking fluids. I always tell people focus on functional beverages, beverage that provide benefit to our health in some way. Pop, whether it's regular or diet, definitely doesn't provide any function to our diet. Milk is a really nice way to get some functional beverages in our diet. And if you want to incorporate more of those phytochemicals in, you could consider switching to a soy milk to get some more isoflavones in. Juice, I always encourage people not to eat more or drink more juice than what they would eat in fruit in a sitting. So if you're sitting down to a 16 ounce glass of juice, I'm willing to bet it takes maybe eight oranges to make that glass of juice. Would you eat eight oranges in one sitting? Probably not, although great source of fiber if you do choose to eat more fruit in that sitting. But I would encourage people to keep their juice intake to a small portion size and consider maybe uh, more of a vegetable juice like a carrot turmeric juice or something similar. As for alcohol, all, there's convincing evidence that alcohol drinks are the cause of mouth, pharynx, oropharynx, esophagus, colorectal, and breast cancers. And the effects of alcohol are directly linked with that ethanol. Ethanol acts like a solvent and it enhances the penetration of carcinogens into the cells that can directly damage DNA. And alcohol acts synergistically with tobacco. Um, so it's going to increase your risk if you both smoke and um, you drink alcohol. Studies also show in modest increase in breast cancer risk when taking even one standard drink per day. And so a standard drink would be one for women, um, or excuse me, our recommendations would be two standard drinks for men or 
one for women. And that counts as 12 ounces of one standard drink counts as 12 ounces of regular beer, five ounces of wine, or 1.5 fluid ounces of uh, 80 proof distilled spirits. And then making good habits. So when we focus on making changes to our diet, we want to set it as a priority. I think a lot of us um, want to eat healthier, but it gets lost in the daily shuffle of everything that's going on. It takes a commitment to try new foods and bring new things into the house, especially if you're not familiar with how to cook them or how to prepare them. Um, and try to focus on these changes when you have um, the opportunity to, you know, if life is really crazy, it may not be the right time to focus heavily on making those changes. Um, still just focusing on the habits that you can make changes to in that time frame. I always tell people, think of your body as a bank. Don't focus on everything you have to get rid of, but how you can keep depositing more phytochemicals into your diet on a consistent basis. So every time you can incorporate more of those phytochemicals in food form and whole food form, you're adding to that health bank essentially. Occasionally we withdraw, right? Um, either intentionally or because we don't have the choice, but on a consistent basis, the more you can incorporate in, I take pride in the fact of what you can add to your diet. Um, sometimes it's hard to make those changes, um, but we can learn to like new foods and eventually grow to love them. So I wanted to leave you with a few resources. Um, if you see up on my screen, you can see um, a few different pictures of these websites up in the uh, right hand corner, you have the ARCI food facts, you can see all of those foods that I had listed on the slides earlier. Um, Mayo Clinic also has some meatless recipe ideas. Um, and you can actually just Google meatless recipes, um, Mayo Clinic, and you'll you'll find a plethora of different recipes there. And it's not again that you have to eat meatless, but anytime you reduce some of those animal, be animal based sources of nutrition, it just makes room for more of those phytochemicals. Um, also some resources over here when we talk about um, cost savings, there's a shop simple with my plate. This is a phone app that will help you save some money and still get some more plants in your diet. In the upper left hand corner, it will give you some resource or uh, it'll allow you to take a quiz um, on this website. And again, I have on the next slide, I have all of these websites listed out. So if you want to get your phone ready or if you can screenshot the screen, I'm going to show you some resources here uh, that you can utilize. So like I mentioned, um, the previous slide were just pictures, and then here are the websites themselves. And there are a few additional um, websites on here that I love to include, like this PCARM is Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. There's lots of also um, plant-based meals on there. And then oncologynutrition.org is a really nice website because it focuses on, again, nutrition and cancer and what are those hot topics, whether it's breast cancer and soy or prostate cancer uh, and um, salt. There's a lot of resources on that website. All right. And then a few ideas for cookbooks listed here as well. So if you do want to incorporate more plants in your diet, again, plant based on a budget is a really nice cookbook uh, that focuses on how you can get $30 a week um, meal or meals for $30 a week and make them all in less than 30 minutes. Um, and then of course, some other um, cookbooks there too. I'll just pause a minute so you can take a picture or screenshot it if you'd like. And then last but not least, my resources here. Oh, sorry, meal services. If you do the meal services, which I saw on the poll, a few people do, there are some plant-based meal services out there. And then my resources. All right, Christy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Awesome information, Grace. Um, I think we're going to do the three poll questions that we have left. Um, and then there's several really great questions in the chat. So we will get to some of those as well. We likely won't get to all of them, but we'll get through as many as we can. So um, if you want to go ahead and answer the first poll question, what types of food or drink prevent colon cancer? This is the second time we're asking you this one. Um, you can select multiple answers. 
We'll give you just a second to answer and then we'll show the results. All right, so there's the results. This time we didn't, we got right on, right? Fruits, vegetables, and whole grains is the correct answer. So thank you very much for that. Our next poll question. After attending this webinar, do you have a better understanding of the importance nutrition can play in cancer prevention? All right, and we'll share the results for that one as well. So 100% yes. Well, good. I'm glad that everybody found this helpful. And our final question for you, do you plan to modify your diet or implement other lifestyle changes as a result of this presentation? All right, almost everyone is a yes. So again, thank you so much for answering these questions. Um, and I know we have several in the chat um, questions that hopefully we can get to a few of these. So I will start at the top and kind of moderate for you, Grace, if that is okay. Um, this this kind of goes back to the beginning. Does the breastfeeding prevent cancer in the mother or the baby? Both. There are studies to show it helps uh, both the mother and the infant. Great. Next question. What is considered a processed meat? Is non-organic chicken breast considered processed? So processed meat are like those lunch meats, hot dogs, um, even organic processed lunch meat is processed. So, um, you know, some processed lunch meats focus on reducing nitrates and nitrites, which um, also have some link to that colon cancer. So there are some options that are slightly healthier out there. Um, but still, again, think about how that is impacting your intake of other phytochemicals you could get in your diet. And could you go uh, down a different path with those lunch meats and find a different sandwich spread or options? So uh, things like you can, you can make um, tofu egg salad, which would be a, a great um, like lunchtime replacement for a lunch meat. But yeah, so processed lunch meat, hot dogs and uh, ham or turkey that you find in the deli section, whether it comes from the deli counter or it's one of those like Hillshire farm um, meats. Ham is a processed lunch meat. All right. How important is it to eat only organic fruits and vegetables? So organic just means that you have not, um, that, that produce is not raised uh, in an environment where there was pesticide or herbicide. And so there's some schools of thought that when you decrease that pesticide or herbicide produced um, produce, um, you're going to decrease the potential chemicals in your diet by doing so. There are studies and there are uh, websites that actually look at how much pesticide or herbicide re residue are on a lot of these items to cause potential harm. And there, in many instances, very little amount. So I always tell people you're far better eating more plants conventionally raised or organic than not eating any at all or avoiding those options because you feel like, you know, organic is the only option for you. There are still phytochemical benefits in a wide range of, of produce, organic or conventional. Great. Next question. I recently switched to a plant-based diet and feel great. I do notice I'm resorting to staples each week though for simplicity making the same vegetable soup, etc. How important is variety so long as everything is plant-based? Well, variety is important. Um, you know, when we talk about plant-based nutrition, especially if you're not having any sources of 
of animal protein in your diet, we want to make sure that the amino acid profile that you do take in is balanced because there are nine essential amino acids we don't get in our diet. And so variety is important, but if you are on like a kind of a staple diet, if you can evaluate, are you getting a wide range of amino acids in there, um, in that diet throughout the day, then you should be good. And if you have a combination of rice and beans, you're probably hitting all of those, but it's always a great thing to just research and evaluate how balanced is it. But yeah, you can, you can have staples, but like I mentioned earlier, a lot of foods work synergistically together. So if you can throw variety in there every once in a while, you're going to potentially get some more phytochemicals you wouldn't if you um, stuck with the same food every day. All right. And we'll do one final question. Do you think raw versus cooked really matters? Yeah. So the interesting thing is when you, um, so there's a, a pretty cool author out there who looks at the antioxidants in different foods. And so she's looked at, you know, how many antioxidants are in foods, um, whether it's cooked raw or just based on plant variety. And what she's actually uh, found is that cooked carrots, when they're cooked, um, peeled and cut after they're cooked, they're actually higher in antioxidants than what they are before. And some of it's based on the plant protective nature it has itself. So plants naturally produce those compounds and oftentimes to protect itself in real life and nature. So for instance, like lettuce, if you take that out of the garden and you um, wash it in cold water and rip it and then leave it in the fridge for a day, it's actually higher in antioxidants than if you eat it fresh straight from the garden. So it's really kind of interesting. And I know we can get hung up on all the specific details, um, but I think the base of it is, is just focus on variety uh, when you can. But no, raw versus um, cooked doesn't always make a difference when it comes to antioxidants or phytochemicals in general. Great. Thanks for the questions. Yes, great questions. Grace, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Um, I think we got a lot of really wonderful information. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, again, we'll be sending out the resources along with a recording of the presentation in the next um, few days to everyone that was registered. So thank you so much for being here and have a great afternoon.